I'm the LGBTQ clinical coordinator at CORA. CORA is the, yes, International Pronouns Day. Um, <laughs> CORA is the sole uh, domestic violence uh, center in San Mateo County. Um, and we provide services to um, all, t all survivors of domestic violence or intimate partner abuse and their children. Um, and that's any type of abuse, which we'll talk a little bit about today maybe, and definitely next week. Um, but if you have any questions about we, what we do at Cora um, for yourself, for your family, for your friends, um, you uh, welcome to ask today as well as uh, to shoot me an email. Um, and I can, would love to tell you more about us. Okay, so our gay agenda for the day um, is, uh, and for next week too, is to talk about in identity and intersectionality, as well as int uh, intimate partner violence, which is that IPV um, for LGBTQ folks. Um, and I know LGBTQ is a mouthful. Um, it's a large community of very different, very different people that have just kind of been smooshed together that don't always agree. Um, so there's a lot to, there's a lot to that and hopefully we'll have some space to talk about it. Um, so just a little bit about um, creating safe spaces and safe discussions. Um, sometimes um, we like to say brave spaces too. Um, so just so the difference between safety and comfort. Safety is that I feel in this space, I can ask questions without fear or judgment. Um, I can voice my perspective and know that I will be validated for the fact that it's my truth. Others may challenge my ideas, but that challenge is in the spirit of greater shared understanding and growth. Comfort, on the other hand, is I feel that in this space, my reality will be agreed with, validated, unchallenged. I don't have to explain myself to be understood, and I don't have to justify my perspective as everyone shares it. It's really nice to be in spaces we feel comfortable, but it's not a guarantee. Right, true dialogue happens in an environment where everyone is safe, but not always comfortable so that we can learn and grow. Um, and then I'll also invite you to, to be brave, to, to be brave to say things that you know, maybe you don't understand or work through. Um, and that we're all holding a lot of compassion for us in our learning. Um, so this is an invitation to be curious about where your values and beliefs come from, curious about your gut emotional reactions, um, be curious about what you know and how you interact with people in the world and, and any challenge to your thinking from anybody in this group is from a place of love and compassion for our community, for your school, and for us to grow together. Um, and just a, a little bit about intent versus impact. Um, I hope everybody here will assume best intention from all of us and all of our insights, um, but that we can still apologize for harmful impact we've caused. So something I might've said with the best intentions could, could harm somebody and that I can genuinely apologize and take accountability for that harm, knowing that that wasn't my intention. All right. Oh, so in order to do that, part of us, we just gotta learn how to breathe breathe through discomfort breathe through even our excitement sometimes like we can get so excited excited that we're elevated and that we can lose track um, and not be grounded in the information so we're going to practice breathing together a little bit of a grounding activity um, what we'll do is we'll practice this four rounds and i'll count don't worry we'll do four seconds in inhale through the nose we'll hold it for five seconds and then we'll exhale for six seconds out, out through the mouth. Sound good? Let me see if I can see everybody. Okay. Cool, yes, awesome, wonderful. Um, okay, so having in a seated, comfortable position, if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, I'm gonna invite you to, and if not, um, just having a soft gaze at something in the distance. All right, and then in through the nose. One, two, three, four and hold one two three four five exhale one two three four five six inhale one two three four and hold one two three four five exhale one two three 
four, five, six. Inhale, one, two, three, four, and hold. One, two, three, four, five. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Last round. Inhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, one, two, three, four, five. And exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, coming back to the group, wiggling your toes and your fingers, and gently opening your eyes. Back to the screen, I know. <laughs> um, okay, part of that is really, you know, teaching a skill, introducing a skill and sharing that with you, um, but also inviting you to, you know, provide a lot of breath for yourself today, as well as like throughout your week, like we are really going through, um, tremendous tra collective trauma right now not just with COVID but with our election I'm sure everybody is really holding that so just really taking care of yourself and, and inviting a lot of breath um, to your body okay um, so why are we starting with identity though um, if we're talking about relationships and um, communities relationships don't occur in a vacuum um, all forms of socially sanctioned violence and abuse affect interpersonal relationships. They can inform them too, right? We can actually um, enact the same forms of abuse that um, we do as a society. Um, so today we will work first to understand ourselves, our values, our worldviews, before we seek to understand and relate to others. Um, that's in hopes that we understand more about who we are um, and what we bring into relationships. Part of that um, is to be conscious of our privilege and behave accountably. Um, to ignore our power and our privilege does not make it go away. Um, and that shows up in our relationships, y'all, like not even just our intimate relationships, but with our family, with our friends. This is, this is everywhere, it's rampant. Um, so we gotta start first with ourselves before we can really start to talk about others. Okay, um, this is a James Baldwin quote, the place in which I'll fit will not exist until I make it. Um, I love this because like a lot, of, um, a lot of people with marginalized identities have to create spaces for themselves to exist. It's a form of privilege to not have to think about your identity. Um, people with marginalized identities across the spectrum think about it all the time. Um, with lack of representation of different cultures, classes, gender identity, sexual orientations, immigration status, nationality, like a lack of that representation in our popul popular media, our news, our government, we are often felt lost um, and alone to create ourselves and to nurture spaces where we can seek safety. Um, today we're going to celebrate ourselves and each other by making the invisible visible. And this is a place that we can all exist. Um, because we can make it so. Um, so first, what is privilege? Um, just kind of an overview of some of these terms. Uh, privilege is benefits and advantages a group of individuals within that group gain by sy systematically dominating other groups. It is bestowed unintentionally and automatically. A person may be unconscious of her privilege and um, may not want it. Um, it's still there. However, until a system of domination changes. Privilege is institutional and that is a form of social control through the creation and enforcement of laws upholding the notion that some people in certain social identity groups are superior and more deserving than others. So the idea that um, often an easy one is white privilege that we've understood that um, whiteness is a dominant group in this society in the United States. Um, and that it's kind of taken for granted that certain systems were created to prioritize um, people with white um, identities. Even people who had um, different ethnic or cultural experiences might erase that in order to fit into whiteness in order to have access to that power and privilege in the society. A really powerful um, uh, example of that and investigation of that um, is 
uh, Peggy McIntosh's work on unpacking the invisible knapsack. And she not only like explores that, but gives like a really uh, extensive list of all the different ways that she has taken for granted um, access and, and privileges that she has in her life just daily. Um, one of the ones I really appreciate her naming is like that she can take for granted people in her neighborhood look like her. Um, that going to the store, no one's gonna bother her or um, think that she's stealing something that um, they're gonna wanna help her. Um, that most of the clerks might even look like her even. Um, and that that is something she wanted to question and hold um, and urge other people to, to have awareness around. Um, so while you might have why you might hold privilege in one category, you might be oppressed in another. Um, so while Peggy McIntosh herself um, is white, identifies as white, she's also a woman and in this, or identifies as female. And in this society in America, uh, female uh, identity um, is oppressed by male identity. We live in a patriarchy um, here, which I'm sure a lot of us are aware of. Um, so that she might be holding both a privileged identity as well as an oppressed identity. And um, also just to set the landscape, there are different types of power. Uh, we have social power, um, which is the ability to influence others. There's political power, access to decision makers to accomplish what you want, and economic power, access to or control over distribution of resources. So not just money, like resources, like food, land, um, transportation, like uh, our economy is much more than just like um, credit or bills. Okay. Um, all oppression is connected, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and part of this is about intersectionality, um, which was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. As a, it's a legal term actually. And intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects. It's not simply that there's a, a race problem or a gender problem, class or LGBTQ issue. Many times that framework erases what happens to people who are subject to all of those things. So it's not that we're just like uh, um, layering oppression on top of oppression. It, people's experiences of oppression really change when they hold multiple oppressed or marginalized identities. Um, yeah, and part of this is that we can all participate in a cycle of oppression or in um, forms of oppression if we're not aware um, and that we can always seek to, to um, do something different. So recently there's been a lot of talks of, it's not that you're just like racist or not racist. It's like in order to really fight racism, we have to be anti-racist and do things every day against that system to dismantle it. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm not paying attention to the Slido or anything like that, but if there's any questions, uh, feel free to put them there and you can also put them in the chat box. And if I don't see them, um, I think Alvin or one of the facilitators will shout them out, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to play this video. Let me see if I am. I might stop my share really quick just to make sure I'm sure. Hold on. hear that? What is intersectionality? Intersectionality is a way of understanding social relations by examining intersecting forms of discrimination. This means acknowledging that social systems are complicated and that many forms of oppression like racism, sexism and ageism might be present and active at the same time in a person's life. Everyday approaches to building equality tend to focus on one type of discrimination, for instance sexism, and then work to address only that specific concern. But while the career of a young, white and able-bodied woman might improve with gender equality protections, an older, black, disabled lesbian may continue to be hampered by racism, ageism, ableism and homophobia in the workplace. 
Intersectionality is about understanding and addressing all potential roadblocks to an individual or group's well-being. But it's not as simple as just adding up oppressions and addressing each one individually. Racism, sexism and ableism exist on their own, but when combined, they compound and transform the experience of oppression. Intersectionality acknowledges that unique oppressions exist, but is also dedicated to understanding how they change in combination. The roots of intersectionality lie within the black feminist movement, with legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw originating the term. Crenshaw felt that anti-racist and feminist movements were both overlooking the unique challenges faced by black women. She stated that legislation about race is framed to protect black men, and legislation about sexism is understood to protect white women. So simply combining racism and sexism together does not therefore protect black women. Intersectional theory is now applied across a range of social divisions and also to understandings of domination, such as those associated with whiteness, masculinity and heterosexuality. Intersectionality is not only about multiple identities and it's not a simple answer to solving problems around equality and diversity. It is, however, an essential framework as we truly engage with issues around privilege and power and work to bring them into the open. Intersectionality means listening to others, examining our own privileges and asking questions about who may be excluded or adversely affected by our work. As importantly, it means taking measurable action to invite, include and centre the voices and work of marginalised individuals. Okay, so we're actually... Oh, Okay, so we're um, going to actually practice this <laughs> um, by understanding the multiple um, layers. And this is not extensive, right? There's other forms of identities that we also hold. But this is a, um, a, a list that I, I really enjoy because I think it does get a, a good uh, grasp of a lot of them. Um, so this is uh, the addressing factors model, which was created by Pamela Hayes. Um, and it's it's a way to inform um, a lot of our intersecting identities. Um, so A stands for age, generation. So um, like, when were you born? What was your generation? What's your age right now? Uh, developmental disabilities are um, disabilities that you were born with um, or, or neurological cognitive ones that affect your learning. Um, disabilities acquired throughout life. Those are ones that you, you um, have from experience of, of different accidents or incidents um, throughout your life, religion or spirituality, ethnicity or racial identity, uh, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status. I'm going to add education to that too. So not just um, where you're at with what your job is, but sometimes like, um, not sometimes, when you're actually um, seeking education, higher education that does put you at a different um, social status and in our in our country on name that at least in this society so while you might be like bruh i don't have any money i'm hella poor like your degree provides you opportunities for different kinds of jobs um, that might have access to upward mobility um, i is indigeneity so where where are your people from are, are you uh, native to this land um, N is natural origin, which is like also your citizenship status. And do you speak, um, like what languages are, do you speak? Is that, do you speak uh, the language that's prominent in the country that you're in? And also gender and gender presentation. So we're gonna actually do this, but I'm gonna show you mine just to give you an example. Bam, all right, I've been like this for a minute. <laughs> uh, so my age, I am 30, fresh. So I got that little baby face and missing teeth, um, I have, which means I'm a millennial. I'm part of this um, generation everybody keeps talking about that's so lazy and opinionated, but we're also really special because um, we were born at the crux of not needing technology and then all of a sudden needing technology the kind of birth of cell phones um, i was not born with any disabilities um, i have had ptsd and depression um, my family has a history of diabetes so that's also in the back 
of my mind of something that could easily happen in my life. Um, my religion, I was, <laughs> was raised Russian Orthodox, it's part of my family, uh, but I do not practice that. I consider myself spiritual. Uh, my ethnicity, I am African American and second generation Slovak American. Um, yeah, very rooted um, as an immigrant and also descendant of slaves. Um, I am queer. Yes, <laughs> that's how I identify. Um, and I have a female partner. I am working class or come from working class families. Uh, my family is working class, excuse me. I'm the first child in my family to graduate college. Um, but now I have a professional job and a graduate degree. So I'm, I have made changes in my family. Um, I am not native to this land um, or know of my indigeneity. Uh, I am a U.S. citizen and I speak English, I'm a native English speaker. Um, and then I am cis female, but my presentation is masculine of center. So just in this, I'm, I'm holding in a part of a lot of oppressed identities, but I hold a lot of privilege in the society. Um, and I can hold both of those things as true. And that even sometimes the privileges that I hold, I can use it as advantages to the um, communities of oppression that I also exist in, right? Like my white or light-skinned privilege can help my, um, my African-American family, right? That can, I should maybe can put myself in positions to help um, facilitate conversations, to get access to things, to help keep my family safe. Um, so I know that and that's a, sometimes a lot to hold, um, but it's also sometimes really necessary. Okay, so I want you to write these down. I'm gonna go back to the other screen. Um, yes, wonderful. Thanks for putting that in the chat, Alvin. Um, 